pick up back where we left off. I was talking a little bit about uh, provisionalization. And, and, and the thing about this is if, if you have to have a front tooth replaced with an implant, your options are to put a temporary on immediately in those, in, in, with those inherent risks, a flipper. Uh, some people will take the tooth out, bone graft it, go back, place the implant later. The patient's got to have some kind of provisional appliance, Essex appliance. Uh, you should have some of those made for you, yourself and wear them and see, see how you do with them. You know, a flipper parcel is just not a real blast to wear. Essex appliances don't hold up that well. We've just gone to almost exclusively putting temporaries on the same day. It's a good example of where you, you can have an issue where this guy, we're replacing both of these central incisors, and he wants to have some fixed temporaries. So what this is, I think they call this an encore bridge, where for a while they were making Maryland bridges with uh, preet fiber or, or some kind of mesh and acrylic and so forth. So we'll use this, bond this to these adjacent teeth. This will serve as his, his provisional replacement while these implants are healing. Uh, after he's healed adequately, then we can come back and, and, and go ahead and incorporate peak abutments into these implants. Go ahead and shape up. See that cement right there? Go ahead and shape up these and create a nice emergence profile uh, to restore a case like this. So I'm going to go through the steps. This is a case... Hey Daryl, can you can y'all dim this this these lights here in the front? Okay. So this is a guy that we're going to do some immediate provisionals on, and this is something that we do just every single day of the week. He's got a failing fixed bridge here, all right. And so basically, what we're going to do is we're going to section the bridge here and over here, all right. And here we're using osteotomes to create the osteotomies. In other words, it's a, you know, we made our pilot drill. Now we're going to do the rest by hand. These come in different diameters. They start off at 2.8 and go all the way to 5.6. And then after we've, it, it, what I've, lately I'll place one implant, then I'll come back and place the other one instead of trying to do both at the same time. So here we are placing an any ridge implant in that first bicuspid site. And I'm going to go ahead and put an extension on so we can look at the lineup. And then we're going to start creating the osteotomy for the second bond, because this is a tight spot, a really tight spot. So now we, here's our pilot drill. Enlarging that osteotomy a little bit. And then we'll go ahead and place our second implant here. So we're still doing the osteotomy. One more over, over there. Joel, can you all do that one too? Thank you. And putting the second implant in. Thanks, that's a lot better. And so now we have both implants in place. Here we are here. So this is a tight spot, a real tight spot. But these do nicely. The nice thing about platform switching is you can get a little closer to one another than you can with non-platform switched implants. Here's showing my initial pilot drill. You can see, like I mentioned before, here we're a little off course. So we'll take that handheld osteo osteotome, kind of straighten that out, place that implant, and then go ahead and place the second one after. The thing I want you to see is, though, this guy insisted on having teeth during the healing phase, which many patients do. And so we've got our peak abutments in place. All right? Then we're going to go ahead and suture everything up around these things. Then we're going to fill each one of these with some Teflon and flowable composite. After we've, I've used a little electrosurge. I can use the electrosurge here because I'm, I'm running up against plastic and I'm not touching the implant or anything like that. But I'm reshaping that tissue uh, so that we can suture, uh, suture together real nice. And then we're going to take a preliminary impression that we made ahead of time. We're going to, we have these in place in the mouth. Fill this up with exact tampo integrity or whatever you're using. Then take it all out of the mouth after. Okay? So I'm taking this out. Unscrew these out of the mouth. Go in the lab. Insert these into the uh, integrity. And see it looking kind of rough. We'll clean all this stuff off. Fill all this in with flowable composite. You know, put it on the lathe, polish it up, reshape it. So we're going to wind up with this right here, where this is polished up. We've got nice emergence profile. And then we're just going to go ahead and screw this right into place in the mouth, just like so. So we'll let that sit in there, let all this heal around here. We'll let this sit in here for a good three months. And after three months, if the x-rays look good, we'll simply open up these two holes, unscrew those splinted temporaries, put the impression transfers in, take our impression, screw that back in. 
and then send it off to the lab, let them make the custom abutments, and the temporaries are even the final crowns. And this is just a routine, 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 routine thing. So, moving right along, we're going to jump back and forth, as I said before. I just want to mention a little bit about connective tissue grafting, which I think is a big deal. Somebody asked earlier about using a tissue punch. I think we just got it. And, and same thing with guided surgery. You know, the problem with guided surgery that Carl Miss says is it shows you exactly where the implant needs to be to be in the bone optimally, but it's not, sometimes it's not paying enough attention to the prosthetics, and it's, it's really not paying attention to soft tissue. Sometimes you really have to make an incision and move that buccal soft tissue out of the way because you don't want to compromise it. So here's an example, uh, Hunter, of a case that I did years ago, and this like eight or nine years ago, and the lady comes in the other day. She doesn't like the way this looks. And so if you look right here, look how thin that tissue is. You know, this is not so bad. We can cover this up, but we're going to need to do a connective tissue graft in this area here. And as a matter of hindsight, you know, we, we should have done that back then. This, this abutment may be kind of over-contoured a little bit. Sometimes that will cause the tissue to rise up. But we can get this covered. But, you know, nowadays, definitely a zirconium abutment so we don't have that gray anymore. And definitely paying a lot more attention to, to what's there when we start the case off. This is a case that um, I want to say I did this implant, and then Dr. Winston Deal did this one about eight years later. And when he did, he laid a flap and all this, and this is what we wound up with. And so when we got to talking to her about her treatment options, the, the, the best way to treat this would be to take these two crowns off, bury both of these implants, do a VIP, a, 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 a VIP flap from the palate, and, and then re bury everything, and then come back and uncover it and do all this other kind of stuff. Or we could take both of these crowns off and just put pink porcelain in there, which would really be the way to go. But after the more we talked about it, the more she said, you know, it really doesn't show. I think we're just going to leave it. I was like, I think that's a real good idea. <laughs> now, in a high, a high lip line, uh, that, that wouldn't fly. But these are Caltech implants. This case is 22 years old or something like that. You know, that's kind of where we were back then. I showed this earlier. You know, here's, here's a nice-looking result, except this doesn't look too good. And it's because, you know, the, the dentist used metal abutments. He used all ceramic crowns. Everything's showing through in the tissue as well as, as, well as the crowns themselves, so they're going to have to be done over. So, you know, we've got this extreme. Then we have this extreme. This is a, a, a lady who's a, a patient of ours that, that uh, had these veneers done by a friend of mine, and tooth number six is in the number seven position, and she hates the way that this looks. And so, you know, she's got a little bit of recession there, but this is what she can't stand is, is the way that the canine looks. So what we, what we talked about doing, you see how high this is here? And she notices stuff like this. So what we talked about doing was trying to create something that looked more like this. And so we get this situation where what we're going to do is we're going to take this off, we're going to do a connective tissue graft, bring this down, this is what we wound up with post-op, and this is after the case is finished. You know, it's a subtlety. It's not a big deal, but, you know, having that as part of your toolkit is, is, I think, important, you know, particularly around implants. Um, and do you use a lot of alloderm, or what do you use for connective tissue grafting? Thank you. Me too. You know, there's, there's a lot being said about alloderm and, and perioderm and all that, and... Every now and then I'll talk to Paradox and say, hey, how are you doing that? I'll, Man, you know, it's not like human derm, which comes from the patient. It's free, and it works, uh, it, it works every damn time. And the alloderm, if it gets exposed, it can turn into a mess. It can really turn into a mess. So, you know, the guys like Pat Allen and these guys that use it all the time, I just haven't, I just, I'll just take it out of the palate, you know. And, and uh, uh, I'm glad you said that. It makes me feel good. Um, so that's what we did in this case. You know, it's, it's, it's simple. Connective tissue graft from her palate, drug this down, reshaped all this, did her veneers and, and, and so forth, and she's all happy. Um, here's a case that Mike Malone uh, and I had done. She uh, had to lose this tooth. So he took the, the, the tooth itself and then made kind of a, an ovaponic, but he really shoved it up too high. So when we started off, we kind of had this kind of thing going on. So here we did a little diode laser, uh, released the vestibule a little bit. She's kind of pulling on this area. Connective tissue, palate from, the, connective tissue from the palate. And we're going to go ahead and 
make a little pouch, put that in there, abutments, implants in, peak abutment, okay, is before we started. And we're using the peak abutment to make a custom healing collar, Hunter. That, that, was, that was what I meant. You know, it's a peak abutment, adding acrylic around it, reshaping it, and just letting all this heal, and, and then putting another bonded ponic in that's not quite as long, so, you know, so hopefully we can get this down, okay? And so this is what it looks like. Here's our implant. This is the tooth. This is the ponic that he had bonded to those adjacent teeth, and it, it really did push the tissue up. There's a tapered screw van implant. Here's a custom abutment from uh, Zimmer made this one, okay? Put that in, a little bit of electrosurge, reshaping the tissue, uh, temporization. This is the final result. Mike Bellarina did this crown. Uh, that's why it looks better than my crowns. He's really good, good technician. But, you know, nice, nice, nice result. Uh, but once again, custom abutments. You know, I uh, can't say enough about them. All right. Any questions about any of that? Yes. If I'm making a temper, I don't want the temporary material to go in the hole, okay? So are you talking about for a permanent abutment or for a peak abutment? Permanent abutment. We could have cement go in there. We could do that. Uh, we ju it's just a routine. I want, I want that hole covered up, okay? Because a lot of times I'm sending it back to a referral dentist to make a final impression for a crown. If there's a, bunch, there's a hole there, he's taking an impression of the hole. I want it to look like a, a prep tooth, I guess. Does that make sense? So, in other words, you take an impression of the abutment and send the impression of the abutment to the lab to have the crown made. Correct. Right. Just like plain old simple crown and bridge. You know, it, it's just easy. You know, the lab gets it, make crown. They make crown. They send it back. Hopefully the contacts, occlusion, the shade are good. And we just, it, it, it's just, it's going back to what we've all been raised on and done our whole lives. I know how to do it the complicated way. This just seems to flow. You know, and if the crown's not right, then we're remaking the crown or we're adding contact to the crown or, or, or we're making another crown because the bite wasn't right. It, it was just basically crown and bridge, you know. I got a question, Yes, sir. When you do that, do you find that the lab is just taking an impression of the abutment? Do the lab charge for the implant? Well, the local lab does, and I told them to quit doing it. They had a reason. They said, we have to do a bigger wax up. They said, now you get an anatomically perfect crown with a perfect margin. Don't charge me $100. This is not fair. Okay? I see that all the time. I know. I know it. And it's really, is this for you? No, that's yours. No, you, but that's your slide. Okay, well, how did it get up there? <laughs> we, uh, when I, I, I don't know how, I don't know what the heck's happening here. You know, I, for some reason, that's up there. So there must be more than one PowerPoint plan at once. Oh, we have several of them up. Oh, shit. Look at this. That's the one that's up now, but it's not playing. Let me close. Let me, let's minimize and close everything down. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right. So that one's it right there. Let me close that one down. That's the one you want. There we go. I, I don't know if that's going to work, though. It, it seemed like that one was acting up, too. Oh, it is. Okay, that's good. All right, let's see if we can go back. Some for some reason this went all the way to the end. So we'll talk about this case right here. This is a case that we use as a teaching case at our course. This guy's name is Norman LeBlanc. If you look real hard, you know we've got issues with these anterior teeth, and I don't want to make a flipper or an Essex appliance for him to wear. This is the clinical pictures that were taken with a. Uh, intro camera. So we took these teeth out. There's our pile of drills. Here are tapered screw vents. And then we're just going to go through the sequence. These are peak abutments from Zimmer. I like the ones that we haven't made better because they're real thin. These, you've got to grind them down to where your, your uh, preoperative impression is going to fit over that so you can make your provisionals. But this is just going through the sequence that, that we'll do sometimes in the office. Here, this is uh, uh, hydrocolloid material. Uh, we're taking a triple tray impression. Then we're going to unscrew these out of the mouth, stick them into the impression. And once again, we'll pour this up with Mach 2 and Blue Moose, which is from Parkell. 
And the idea is I want to get a rubber model, and then I can go ahead and do every, all the rest of my work here instead of in the mouth. So we'll take a diamond burr and, and prep these things back, okay? You know, uh, in this case, I use a lathe. Put them back on the model, block out these holes, and then take my preoperative impression, put some integrity, or we use exact attempt, and then seat this over. And so now I, I can make my temporaries. You know, I've customized the peak abutments and made the temporaries outside of the mouth. Then after a few minutes, this sets up. Here we use an exact attempt. This is all set up on the rubber model. Then I'll go ahead and access the screw holes. And we're going to go ahead and fill in to create good emergence, remove all this flash, polish everything up. So now we got them all sutured up. And these pictures aren't great because I use my iPhone. We've got Canon and all these pictures, and I was just lazy, so I said, I'm just going to use my iPhone. So anyway, this is what the guy I left with, three-unit fixed bridge. You know, and, and, and I think this is cool because he's not having to wear some kind of appliance. You know, it, like I said, have a flipper made for yourself. Just cover, you know, two-thirds of your palate, and, and it's like having two stick, two um, packs of chewing gum slammed against your palate. You're trying to speak, and... You know, you ask an attorney or a school teacher or a physician or anybody to wear something like that, you're not going to be in their fan club, I can tell you. I mean, they, 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 I had a guy the other day, he'd, he'd seen another dentist have his lower implants, and all he complained about was the thing that they made him wear during the interim. And he broke it three times, and he couldn't eat with it, and he left it in a restaurant and all that. We put immediate provisions on, on there all day long, and I feel comfortable, real comfortable, doing this with an implant that gives you the same kind of... A, uh, initial stabilization that the, that the any ridge uh, does. What do, you, what do you tell the patients as far as eating? I tell them not to chew on that at all, and I tell them it's made out of a real weak material because it is weak. You know, exact attempt, all those things that come out of a gun are, are real brittle and they break easy. Uh, so I tell them, you know, you, you just need to stay off of it altogether uh, or else it breaks and then they come back in. And then, you know, it's almost like a... Joel, what is the name of the thing y'all have now called a fuse? fuse yeah. Explain what that is fuse while I get more organized here. So fuse abutment is a three-angled and uh, both 15 degree and 25 degree scalloped abutment, very similar to what uh, Dr. Smith was talking about as far as anatomic abutment. It's just a provisional abutment now, and you can use that immediately for a, a provisional with your you know, denture tooth or suck down or whatever you want to use. Doesn't it break at a certain... Yes. <laughs> you want it to, you kind of want it to break, you know. Um, so I had a guy one day, we did two immediate lateral incisors. Both of them didn't, in a, in a, it didn't integrate. It's a long time ago. And I said, what have you been doing? He goes, well, I've been chewing on chicken bones. And I said, you know, I asked you not to eat on those things. And I said, I'm going to do them over for you because you were honest with me, because most people aren't honest. And I always tell patients, I trust women to do what we ask them to do. I don't necessarily trust males. As soon as it starts feeling better, they start eating on it. And what we see is the uncementation rate and the, the temporary breakage rate with the men is three times more than it is with women. So I'm a little bit more careful about doing immediates on males. But once again, with this system, we, we really seem to be having a good batting average. This is a lady um, that uh, Mike and I did together. Uh, this is the after picture after we got done. But what I want you to see in this case is this is what she presented with. Uh, we, had a C <laughs> we had a CRNA come in to sedate her. And when I walked in the room, I said, well, how's she doing? She goes, it's a good thing you didn't just give a Versed and Demerol. She said, after we gave a Versed, she was cussing everybody out in the bill and just, she just went crazy. And so they use, CRNA uses propofol, and then she was fine. But the point being is this lady had a drinking problem, and that's probably what brought a lot of this on. Her husband owns a very successful restaurant in Lafayette, uh, and, and they're really high-profile people. You wouldn't think she'd be running around looking like that. But it was phobia. I mean, that was the main thing. Was she was just scared to death. So these patients are, are put to sleep. This is what we started off with. Um, uh, these are tapered screw band implants that were placed back then. This one area, there was one area that we delayed placement on. I don't remember, but look at this. This is not right. But we're able to correct this with the custom abutments. Obviously, you know, we can't always get these parallel. This is not into the root. It's just that we came in too posteriorly on the, on the, uh, on the, on the 
PA. But, you know, particularly in a case like this, you know, parallelism is, 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 kind, of a, is kind of tricky. So here is, this is from Zimmer. They email me these files. This is look okay. Well, you know, it looks fine. They've, they've corrected all of my errors and made everything nice and parallel. So that once these abutments go into place, it's going to be very easy for the restorative dentist, or for me, whoever's restoring this, to take our final impressions and, and get a real nice result. So, you know, this technology is, is really pretty nice because you can see what's going on here. And, you know, uh, these, these look a lot more parallel. This is parallel now. Um, and so here's the final upper. Here's the lower posterior still in provisionals. Um, and then he just went ahead and finished up the, the, uh, finished up the case after that. Here's a full upper. Um, just blow up with that. Smile. You know, nice work. So... There's been a lot said about platelet-rich plasma, and it was a $10,000 centrifuge, and, and you had to, you know, you spin the blood, and then you'd have to buy $100 worth of disposables for every case that you did to try and, and help out with bone augmentation and also particularly to help out with soft tissue healing. So over the years, PRF has become very popular. It stands for platelet-rich fibrin, and we'll talk about how we use that in practice in combination with bone augmentation and, and uh, in, in implant treatment. But the thing we want to talk about first is socket preservation, sinus augmentation using a lateral or crestal approach. Uh, in, in just the conventional call well luck approach, immediate placement with augmentation, and then the materials, the barriers, and the immediate provisionalization that we've been talking about a little bit earlier today. And then the routine. It is really the kind of discovered, I guess, or, or really brought into popularity by Dr. Chokin, who's from France. And I want to say the guy's like an anesthesiologist or something. He's not a dentist. But he's the one that's really done all the research. And it's an autogenous matrix derived from concentration of the patient's blood uh, platelets. It's a real simple chair-side procedure that results in producing a fiber membrane that stimulates bone and soft tissue growth. It's rich in leukocytes and vascular endothelial growth factor. And it, it, it's, it's, it's got some advantages. It encourages rapid healing, especially during the first seven days. This is done chair side. It's got biologic accelerators that aren't present in PRP or PRGF. It, uh, it's got great work, working possibilities. You can cut it. You can manipulate it. You can suture it. Uh, you got plenty of working time. And it's a fiber network that's very similar to the natural one. And it's very cost effective. It doesn't cost much. Um, so... We're going to get this accelerated tissue situation because of effective neovascularization, wound closing, uh, remodeling. Uh, there's, there's almost no infectious events involved. It's just slick. And this is what we're trying to create is we're trying to get these guys uh, from the, the, the uh, centrifuge tubes. So in other words, we take, let's say, four tubes of blood from a patient, spin it in the centrifuge for 12 minutes, and then we're going to clip off the red blood cells and wind up with this. And we put this in a box that puts some pressure on it, and it creates a membrane. So we're going to use this membrane to suture around implants, to suture over periodontal defects, and so forth. And this is what these things look like before they've been flattened out. So there's our tubes. Uh, in this case, we place four implants in immediate extraction sites, bone grafts, okay? And we're going to take these, flatten these guys out. We can also use this to fish with. It's real good bait. Uh, on uh, is that lake you live on? <laughs> yeah, Lake St. John. That's very popular over there. Um, we'll also flatten this out and, and use in a situation like this. And we'll look at this guy's case in a minute. Here we've done a sinus elevation, put our graft in there. We'll also there are a lot of dentists that are using this instead of all this bone graft material. Have you done any like that? So you, I mean, it's the real deal, huh? Okay. Yes. All of the above, yeah, all, all of the above. I mean, it's just, you know, when we, when we remember to. You know, not every implant, okay, but every case that we're going to do that's a little bit involved from the, tissue, from the standpoint of soft tissue manipulation, from the standpoint of bone grafting and placing the implant at the same time, so we need a membrane over that. You know, any of those situations, if we're just taking a tooth out and the implant's going right in, there's, there's no need to do all that. But having said that, I mean, it, 
we sedate most of our patients, so we have IV access. So, to, you know, to take the blood and have somebody go spin it down the hall is not that big of a deal. Um, the other day, the, the thing broke. The centrifuge broke. And um, the timer was broken on it. So my dental assistant was getting ready to order another centrifuge for like $1,500. I said, hey, put that thing in the lab, and I got my voltmeter on. I said, the timer's no good, so I disconnected it. And I said, when y'all want to centrifuge blood, what you do is you go plug that thing in, <laughs> and you set your watch <laughs> or your iPhone. I ain't buying another one, all right? Man, they, they, we can spend some money in dentistry. Anyway, so in this situation where we've done a, 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 a sinus lift, we're going to pack the inferior portion with fusion bone binder and mineralized freeze-dried bone, in the superior portion, I'm going to add a bunch of this stuff up there. Then I'm going to put a flat one over the access, which you see right here, and then close this up. In the case that I was showing it a minute ago, this guy right here, we've taken out his lower teeth. Uh, we've bone grafted around these, um, these implants. And here is the PRF membranes around these implants covering, you know, basically take a rubber dam punch and punch a hole through this stuff and then drape it over these things. And then, uh, you know, relieve the flap, draw it over here, and, and this is healing after a few months. Well, you're going to get healing like that from just about any case you do. The point is, when we've got grafting, concomitant implant placement and grafting, we really need to have some kind of membrane over that. And this is made from the patient's blood. It is, and sometimes I'll use it in conjunction with a collagen uh, uh, membrane as well. Uh, but really just part of, part of a routine that we use day to day. Let me see if this link's going to work. Okay, good. We got lucky. So this is just showing the whole case. And we're also using something called periogenics, which is an oxygen-infused uh, foam. It's kind of like hyperbarics in a, in a can, in that when we're doing extensive cases like this, the patient's got a means of bringing oxygen into those tissues, which is the most important part of wound healing. And uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but what I wanted you to see is the case that we were just looking at. Here is pre-op uh, Panorex. Here are the tapered screw bed implants in place, post-op, pre-op, pre-op. And, you know, arguably, you could go in there and maybe do a full mouth restoration, things like that. He and I talked about all that. When we present cases, we try and look at all treatment options and show examples of cases, and, and he and I pretty much decided that, you know, taking these teeth out was probably going to be the way to go. So we've got immediate placement here, immediate placement here. That's, that, there's already heel bone here and heel bone here. Okay? There are tubes after they've been run through the centrifuge. Uh, here we're mixing up our, our bone graft material with some of the exudate, uh, the, some of the runoff from the... Uh, from the box that we use to make these membranes. So we'll take this out and clip the red, red blood cell part off. You wind up with this. They call these snot clots uh, for obvious reasons. And like I said, great fishing bait. Uh, here we've got all our graft in place. And there's all of our uh, PRFs. And we flatten them out. We're going to drape those over these grafts all the way around. Like I said before, I use a rubber dam punch to punch a hole in these things. Close all that up three days post-op. Gore-Tex sutures on the upper, lower. We use uh, co-comfort with the immediate dentures. Here we are at 10 days on the top, 10 days on the bottom. Co-soft. 